Hello and welcome to all our viewers joining us live on Facebook and on Zoom. Today's Spa Fasesh is titled The International Museum Day, The Global Museum Movement and the Power of Our Communities in Shaping Our Part of Our World. Returning as our guest speaker, we are pleased and fortunate to have with us museum expert, Dr. Anna Labrador, who is all the way in New York at the moment. So a very good evening to Dr. Anna. But before I hand over the floor to today's SESH moderator, who will properly introduce Dr. Anna, just a reminder to our Facebook audience and Zoom attendees, please do participate in the SESH by submitting questions that you may have for our speaker and you could win yourself a SPAFA souvenir. For those joining us on Facebook, put your questions in the comment box below the live feed. And for those joining us on Zoom, please leave your questions via the Q&A tab. We will be selecting one winner from Facebook and one from Zoom as the winners based on those questions that we receive from you. Please join me now in welcoming the moderator for today's SPAFA sesh who is none other than Simeo Spafa's director, Mrs. Somlak Charan Put. Good morning, Dr. Director Somlak. Good morning, John, and thank you. John is a very precious communication <laughs> officer of Simeo Spafa. We are lucky also to have him. And uh, thank you. we begin our Spafa sesh today. <clears throat> Thank you. First, let me say good morning again to Dr. Anna and uh, welcome back uh, to our SPAFA sesh, uh, which she accepted to be our valuable uh, speaker on the museum topic. And we are so lucky that she agreed to do it in a series uh, type so that we last, uh, two months, I think, uh, we had uh, uh, her talk for the first time and then on museum also. And today we're gonna have another topic, uh, which is uh, quite important, uh, very good timing that we have her on this topic at uh, this period because next month, on the May 18th, it will be the International Museum Day uh, where all the uh, museum uh, around the world will organize activities in order to promote uh, the museum uh, institution to be known among uh, the public. And each year there will be uh, a theme for those museums to uh, widen the perspective of the museum to the public of who we are. I'm not going to say what is the theme of this year. So I will let Dr. Anna uh, be the uh, one who speak on that. But before we go on, even though Dr. Anna needs no introduction because she's a well-known figure in museology uh, around the world and also uh, one of the best in Southeast Asia and Asia. Uh, so let me just introduce her that right now, uh, Dr. Anna Labrador is honorary senior fellow at, uh, of the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies, Faculty of Arts, University of Men Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. But before that, uh, she's been the Deputy Director General for Museums at the National Museum of the Philippines for 10 years. And her, uh, she was responsible for research development, museology and technical assistance. She's done everything, I think, uh, to move those museums. Uh, she, her role is uh, more or less as a chief curator and head of collections management in order to make national collections and sites accessible to audiences uh, in Manila and uh, all the 15 national museum 
of Philippines around the world, I mean, around the country. Uh, she herself is a social anthropologist, anthropologist and museologist by training. Uh, she obtained the uh, PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2000 and an MA in Museum and Gallery Management from the City University of London in 1991. Uh, before she became the Deputy Director General of the National Museum of the Philippines, she was teaching at the University of the Philippines at the Diliman and Antonio de Manila University for 22 years. So you can see how collective of her knowledge is about museum and cultural heritage. So right now, uh, aside from being the senior fellow, she is presently a member of the International Council of Museums or ICOM, a standing committee for museum definition, prospects and potentials which is now working on the shaping of a new definition for museums worldwide, uh, which that subject will be the third on the series that she will talk on Spapa Sesh uh, as our series in, uh, I think in July the 25th, uh, we will announce for it uh, later on. So uh, without any much further ado, even though I want to talk more about you, Dr. Anna, however, I think I should give you the floor right now to uh, present your talk today. Thank you, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kun Samlak. Um, really, really appreciate uh, always the chance to be able to talk, uh, especially on the uh, very prestigious Simeo Spafa <laughs> platform. It's, it's so important, I think, to be able to disseminate what we know. No? We always generate all this knowledge, but we always have to be conscious about why we're doing this and I think it's about sharing and I think we're also lifelong learners right no matter how what age we are we there's always something new and 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 the muse museums can always help um, give us that idea that um, we can never really know everything so I, I'm really happy that I'm able to also do this in time for next month's uh, International Museum Day and why it's it's so important for, for us. So I'll share my slide uh, now so that we can start. Okay. Wait, hang on. I'll start from the beginning. Sorry. I yeah, so this is the um my um main um topic and um, I just want to, to show that the International Mu Museum Day is part of a global museum movement and but we really need to, to share that you know, that um, uh, possibility of uh, being able to um, make sure that that communities around us um, be part of it. It's this notion of in, uh, inclusive museums. As last time, I would like to also um, get your attention regarding the issues um, on um, Ukraine. And uh, of course, the as you uh, are aware, a lot of things are uh, escalating you know, in different parts of Ukraine. Um, so this is a, a picture taken a month ago where cultural objects in Lviv uh, uh, was being secured um, from the from the Russian shelling, no? um, so please please um, check out the Save Ukraine Cultural Heritage online the www.sucho.org so that you could you know, you, you know you can find ways of being able to help. Um, recently, the Museum of Modern Art put together a special exhibition. It's it's like a survey exhibition in just one of their gal. Uh, rooms, no, so that people can be aware that um, 
it's not about just nationalities, but we're also talking about, uh, uh, you know, our concern for the whole of humanity. We're all affected by this. So I um, would like to talk to you about, um, you know, the this this special areas. So I'm going to give a brief history of the International Museum Day, or IMD, as you call it. Uh, why it's a worldwide celebration. Um, examples from my own museum practice and why I myself found celebrating IMD important. What are the themes and aims for uh, 2022? And then the significance of IMD in our region in Southeast Asia. And then the communities in action and participation. And uh, just to give you an idea, no? um, this is the president, uh, Alberto Garlandini, uh, president of ICOM, who's uh, Italian. Um, and uh, he has said in that last year, uh, during the IMD celebration, museums are bridges between people and cultures. Museums promote participation and diversity. Museums innovate and experiment to respond to the social, economic, and environmental challenges um, and, in, and all, uh, challenges of our troubled present. So the um, ICOM, which is the International Council of Museums, uh, was created in 1946 and is a worldwide organization of museums and museum professionals. ICOM is committed to promoting and protecting cultural and um, natural and cultural heritage, present and future, tangible and intangible. With more than 44,686 members, uh, I'm one of those, um, in 138 countries, the ICOM network is made up of museum professionals from a wide range of museum and heritage related disciplines. So ICOM promotes standards of excellence in the museum field, in particular through the ICOM Code of Ethics for Museums, which is currently also under review. And um, it's being, con a lot of uh, museum members are being consulted regarding this. So it is a standard setting tool for museums, which includes basic principles for museum governance, the acquisition and disposal of collections, and rules for professional conduct. ICOM's other activities include fighting illicit traffic in cultural goods and promoting risk management and emergency preparedness to protect world cultural heritage in the event of natural or man-made disasters. So it's a fairly wide um, uh, goal uh, and uh, a scope. So I think people should be aware of uh, this and um, it would be wonderful if you all become members, um, depending on uh, your country's GDP, they usually have a lower um, membership fee for uh, our region. So um, I'll, I'll give you a brief history of International Museum Day 2022, but I found this um, poster um, last for last year because the theme was the future of museums uh, recover and re reimagine. And it's really quite a um, you know, very creative way of um, taking off from the official poster of IMD 2021. So um, let me talk to you about uh, a little bit about the brief history. Um, so it began as the crusade for museums in 1951 to discuss the theme museums and education. Before of, uh, it became officially um, IMD, so the ICOM gathered the International Museum community for a 1951 meeting called Crusade for Museums to discuss the theme, museums, and education. The idea for International Museum Day was inspired by the framework for uh, museum accessibility that was developed at this meeting. Um, so um, the 
1977 celebration began with the notion of creating an annual event with the aim of further unifying the creative aspirations of uh, and efforts of museums and drawing the attention of the world public to their activity. So International Museum Day was meant to convey the message that, quote, museums are an important means of cultural exchange, enrichment of cultures, and development of mutual understanding, cooperation, and peace among peoples, unquote. So, um, so the, in 1997, ICOM launched the first official poster of the event on the theme of fighting illicit traffic and cultural goods. The poster was adapted by 28 countries. So uh, ICOM was also patron of the European Night of Museums for the, the first time that year an event that takes place on the uh, Saturday closest to uh, the 18th May each year. So it's also important that, that uh, this has served as a, a way of strengthening communication. So in, in 2011, uh, institutional partners, a website and communications kit for International Museum Day were introduced, marking a turning point for the event. So, so in 2017, um, the theme was museums and con contested um, history saying the unspeakable in, uh, in, in museums. So it's, it's really quite, uh, um, sometimes the themes are quite difficult in a way that um, it has made us rethink our own practice. So um, on, sorry, on this day, uh, participating museums plan creative events and activities related to the International Museum Day uh, theme, engage with the public and um, highlight the importance of the role of museums as institutions that serve society and its development. So the objective of the International Museum Day is to raise awareness on the fact that museums are an important means of cultural exchange, enrichment, and development of mutual understanding, cooperation, and peace among peoples. So in, tw in 2021, despite the pandemic or perha perhaps because of it, the celebration amplified its impact um, by the development of hybrid activities all around the world, reaching 89 million internet users through social media, news articles, blog posts, podcasts, and more. So I just want to talk a little bit about my own practice and the discussions really from uh, my interaction with people during International Museum Day inspired, uh, was inspired by the framework for museum access, museum accessibility. So let me um, just give you some points of why uh, for me, it's important to celebrate IMD. So I am a professional manager of museums. I felt the compulsion to join our museum colleagues worldwide in IMD celebrations as we should experience being part of something bigger than ourselves. I think that's really quite important. Emphasize the central role that museums can play in the social life of communities. It doesn't have to be um, like a, they just a didactic exhibition. It could be something that that is out of the usual and or because people, when they visit museums, they do take something out of it that's probably different from uh, the, the intention you know, of, of people working in the museum. So developing more inclusive programs that promote the participation of more people I think they should see themselves uh, in our uh, programs. So we create museums and public programs that we should, we all deserve, you know, we should really enjoy it. We should really experience it. 
So May 18 marks an annual cycle globally for our colleagues in the profession in which we can systematically acknowledge our place in heritage work. So it's a, a chance for us to really um, reach out and uh, be part of the bigger thing. So um, when I headed the uh, University Museum at the University of the Philippines called the Vargas Museum, I instituted, sorry about the picture, I couldn't find a, a sharper one. So I instituted this Young Museum Guides at the University of the Philippines, the Vargas Museum. And it became, you know, we really catered first to the children or siblings of the faculty and staff of the university. And then we widened the scope. And it's meant really to be part of the summer program that the university offered. And we started in 2003. So it's, it's really been a success. And uh, I've left, of course, the university museum. And so it's still going. And it's, nine, it's, 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 it's 19th year this year. And then um, one of the things that I really, really wanted to do, and it's, it's having free admissions to museums. And I've seen, um, you know, having visited museums, in different parts of the world, I've seen the difference about you know how people appreciate um, being able to have access to the museum, and especially in, in the Philippines where you know the, there's um, quite uh, more more people who are uh, probably don't have the disposable income. So at the National Museum of the Philippines, we began admitting free um, during National Heritage Month. Uh, and which is uh, May 2012. So the highlight is always the IMD on the 18th of May. And then we encouraged, um, we were encouraged by the high visitor numbers. So the, the National Museum of the Philippines Board of Trustees agreed to make admission free in 2016. This was really quite a um, you know, big step for them because most of them come from the private sector and they don't believe things uh, should be free. You know? So, and then, so in, um, um, in 2019, uh, a new law was passed. Um, it was our National Museum law. And so it's the Republic Act 11333, which made this policy of free admission uh, a law. And uh, I want, I picked this from the, from on, on uh, an online source, uh, former Senator Bam Aquino, Actually, uh, his staff created this poster um, inspired by the film La La Land, which was uh, quite uh, popular during that time in, in 2017. And so uh, the, what it says on the, it's, it's the, the way we kind of commonly speak, you know, La La Lang, which is, you know, you don't have anything for uh, money for date. You can go okay long because you can go to the National Museum because it's free admission. So, so we have to thank uh, Senator Bam Aquino for making making the museum also popular because um, you know it, it's become a date place now. <laughs> so we're very happy. So exper you know you can do that. You can experiment. Uh, we we experimented before we got the approval. Uh, you know to not just have one free month in May. But also we, we looked at uh, milestones like February is National Arts Month in the Philippines. So uh, we decided that we should have free admission for February. And then in October is uh, Museums and Galleries Month. So that has, um, you know, kind of uh, made, 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 um, made strengthened our position about uh, making the admission free. And besides, you know, you have to also look at your own museums. If the target, you know, is not about revenue, but um, it's more to do with, um, um, what do you call this, uh, about visitor numbers, then that's uh, what you could do. So I, I was, you know, this is, um, in terms of um, themes, most of the themes now that, that uh, uh, usually they shape this around November, uh, uh, the year before, 
um, you can create platforms for advocacies. No? And um, the IMD theme in 2017 is museums and contested histories, saying the unspeakable in, in museums. No? So we've adopted this. And in fact, this is uh, ushered in a new way of guiding people within the museum. For instance, uh, what we normally didn't talk about is that uh, the 19th century Filipino master who brought such pride to the Filipinos and you know, helped shape our identity, he actually um, killed his wife. He shot his wife and mother-in-law and um, uh, you know, killed them both. And then at the same time, there was also... Um, you know, all these, this reaction about how he was after being uh, jailed for a short period, he was able to come out of it. No? So because at the time in, in Paris, that's where the murder took place, uh, it, crime of, crimes of passion were kind of excusable. So we have now shaped this um, kind of guiding um, in terms of, you know, kind of revealing secrets about the paintings, about the artists no? and, and other things that, you know, vignettes that you can find um, that that's, of course, true. You know, you have to make sure that uh, what you come up with is actually uh, based on truth. And so you have to do a lot of research. We also uh, investigated, for instance, um, and talked about, you know, like the ethics of collecting adult tops. These are tops that are played in, usually in um, countries like um, uh, Brunei and uh, in the south of the Philippines. We also have this because it's um, uh, part of the culture of the uh, the Muslims, no, in our in our in the southern part of the Philippines. And at the time when we started getting hold of these um, tops, no, that they use for like a sporting game, they um, actually they were part of you know they suddenly um, the the antique market was flooded with these tops, and so we had to make a discussion about, you know, should we collect these and what, to what end, no? And so in, so we thought about um, collecting them, but eventually uh, bringing them back to, um, to Marawi in, in, once they've rebuilt their, um, their city, you know? uh, because there's, there was a conflict there and uh, a lot of the, um, uh, buildings have been destroyed in this, and also residential uh, places. So, so, so you, you know, it's about kind of creating all these different, um, um, you know, permutations from the, the themes that um, the International Museum Day um, celebration um, it, uh, kind of comes up. And you can localize it. So just to show you also the, um, the different uh, museums worldwide and how they kind of celebrate this. I, I like this uh, Boys Museum Association. Uh, they came up with uh, you know, this, this notion about being on the same kind of boat, but not quite. <laughs> um, so there's a, a whole group of Basques you know, in Idaho, in, in you know, in, in the American West. So it's quite interesting how they've, you know, kind of put this all together and make that understandable to their community. And then um, also, uh, for instance, Fiji Museum, um, they celebrate with a cake and it's really wonderful. I think we should make that a tra tradition too. And then the um, Museos de Tenerife um, in 2018, they had a, a grand exhibition that focused on uh, landscapes, you know, museums and landscapes. And, and you know, we, the International Museum, they has become really quite um, uh, famous. People start, has, they've really started talking about this. So in fact, the Erasmus Student Network um, 
they quoted Michelle Obama. And at the back, you can see a faint um, image of a young girl actually looking at the painting of Michelle Obama. So, yes, you know, she's the first lady um, of uh, President Barack Obama. And uh, it is, it's a tradition in, um, in the, the U.S. to have portraits of the president and the first lady made before they leave office. So, um, so the quote goes, there are so many kids in this country who look at places like museums and concert halls and other cultural centers, and they think to themselves, well, that's not a place for me. For someone who looks like me, for someone who comes from my neighborhood, which is the south side of Chicago, I know that feeling of not belonging in a place like this. So, you know, we should really start to be a bit more conscious about how uh, young people um, relate to uh, our public programs, our exhibitions. And then um, this is a scene from last year because most, uh, as you know, because a lot of museums were shot or uh, they had hybrid programs. So the president of ICOM um, sent a message uh, in China, to, to China. And then, so to talk about the future of museums, you know, recover and reimagine. So what, what is the, the theme? No? Uh, what are the themes actually? So it's quite, quite interesting because there are a number of things because it will open up certain ideas. No? If uh, you can ask me more about this later on after I give my presentation, but the main theme is really the power of museums. And so the museum, museums have power to transform the world around us. Um, you know, as incomparable places of discovery. They teach us about our past and, and open our minds to new ideas. So these are two essential steps in building a better future. Um, one of the things that I always uh, talk about is that museums are places where you can see real objects. It's not virtual, really. But then when we uh, had the, you know, the lockdown, we started reassessing this notion that it's um, because we didn't have a choice at that point where, you know, uh, we should be satisfied with a virtual presentation. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So the power of achieving sustainability means that museums are strategic partners in the implementation of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. As key actors in the local communities, they contribute to a wide variety of goals, which include fostering short circuit and social economy and disseminating scientific information on environmental challenges. Second is sub, sub theme or aims is the power of inno innovating on digitalization and accessibility. So museums have become innovative playing grounds where new technologies can be developed and applied to everyday life. Digital innovation can make museums more accessible and engaging, helping audiences understand complex and nuanced concepts. Although um, in some areas um, in our region, we can talk about this notion of digital divide where some of the uh, you know, areas with uh, a lack of uh, access to internet might not have that. But I, I, I think you also have to go back and reuse, for instance, um, old bro broadcast platforms like radio. I love the radio. Um, uh, you know, when I was doing field work, or I, I, I usually just listen to radio while I'm doing research, and you know, especially in in areas where you don't get much, um, you know, signals or even uh, access to television. So make use of that because that's a way of really reaching out to the furthest parts of uh, uh, your country. You know, um, so it's it's really quite powerful in that way. 
And then the power of community building through education really means um, through collections and programs, museums uh, thread a social fabric that is essential in community building by upholding um, democratic values um, and providing lifelong learning opportunities to all. They contribute to shaping an informed and engaged civil society. So, you know, it's, it's this notion where we feel that we're really part of a, a bigger thing. So to, to make um, uh, the, the I am the success, you, you know, you, you're helping um, museums worldwide by, by uh, looking into some of the, the steps um, that, that, you know, you can take. So one is um, you can implement partnerships with schools associations, libraries, other museums, etc., to promote your event and reinforce your links with organizations with similar goals. So um, you could advocate for the role of museums in our societies by letting local, regional, and national authorities know about your activities and why they matter for the general public. So you can talk to your local politicians, your, uh, you know, the, like uh, people who manage um, the cultural heritage of a site. Your local historians, for instance, are quite important. But, but do, do um, check out some of the already um, embedded um, um, kind of institutions like libraries. It's very, very important to um, also, um, you know, work with them, the librarians and, and, you know, how to also enrich some of the uh, books that are in, in libraries and perhaps you can um, create the, you know, like a form of storytelling from that. And then you can spread information about International Museum Day through the local press your social media, and your website. You can also gain international visibility about your activities by sharing information about your International Museum Day events with ICOM. Uh, there is a platform uh, where you can access that um, and uh, allowing us to spread the news throughout our network and beyond. So um, there is actually a, if you search IMD 2022, you can actually look at the, the, um, a source, um, in, uh, com a communications kit, where you can, uh, you can uh, have more ideas of how to celebrate the IMD. It's sometimes, um, you can use it as a, uh, you know, you, the, the day itself as a milestone for your museum. What, what have you gained from having all these programs? Um, assess, um, you know, your collections, even ask why are those objects in your museums? How can you um, tell stories about them, um, et cetera? So there's, there's really a lot that you can do. Um, um, and you can, after, after the event, um, it, Perhaps I've seen some museums extend the event beyond, um, you know, May 18, sometimes reaching until the end of May or even the first week of June, and, but label, labeling it, uh, it as such. You know. So International Museum Day, um, you know, you create hashtags for it. Um, and this has come out, you know, people read about International M Museum Day, 977 million times in 41 different languages. So, you, you know, this, this idea of being part of something bigger than we are is, is really quite uh, interesting. And, um, you know, like 50,000 Facebook posts, uh, tweets, uh, YouTube videos, and 20,000 news articles. So it's a, 
wonderful thing. And then if you notice the poster for 2018, IMD 2018, it's a QR code. No? And it's actually, um, it's so easy now to uh, know how to, to use QR codes. And um, it's really one of those types of technologies that can uh, assist you in um, you know, like uh, not overwhelming, for instance, your exhibitions with text and simply put the QR codes there and so that you can have a very brief label and then you can um, develop that further with, um, with uh, and, you know, people can gain access to that through uh, QR codes. So the significance of IMD in our region is actually with the power of museums, our region could use May 18 as a means of revitalizing our museums and encouraging visitors to go beyond the digital programs and start physically coming to see our exhibitions again. Um, because they've been uh, our experience um, in a, a number of museums where people are a bit still afraid of taking the risk, afraid of getting COVID-19. So it's a matter of developing uh, a kind of uh, a confidence. No? And then rethink our programs and part of community transformation. So local languages in our exhibition labels, uh, accessibility, inclusivity, and audience engagement. Um, I think the main thing is really to think about how, how do you uh, what what do you think of um, you know in, in, when when you're putting together exhibitions or public programs, who who is really your audience? Um, you have to kind of create a more targeted way of um, developing that. And in the case of the National Museum of the Philippines, what we've done is actually to focus more on local uh, the local uh, visitors no? and so if you do that you think about basically it's really um, focusing more on um, uh, on languages that are 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 accessible no? it's not just uh, you know the difference in in uh, in in the languages but it's also what level um, are you going to use no? So um, look, when we do the local language, it's usually like um, uh, bilingual or trilingual, um, depending on what languages are spoken locally. Uh, but as I said, you, you know, you, we shouldn't really overwhelm um, your audience with text. Uh, you have to develop their visual eye um, to learn how to look at things. And so you can develop um, other text through uh, QR codes, and then they can gain access to that if they have a QR code reader on their smartphones. We have to think about, you know, um, recovery from the pandemic and how we, do we see our future? How do we move uh, on from, from here? Because it's, uh, the pandemic is still happening and, you know, you hear all these um, you know, news accounts of um, number of uh, uh, infected uh, people uh, are on the rise again, like in China and now in, in Italy again and, and so forth. So how do we deal with this? You know? And how can we use the museum as a platform? So museums can become healing spaces for both staff and the public. Um, I've written about this in that uh, the Museum International, uh, one of, I'm, I wrote an article in the Museum International Journal, the recent one, um, because I think it's, it's time that we focus more on that. It's not just uh, something that's opportunistic, it's something that's, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, we stumble upon, but really develop programs uh, you know, on that score. Like, um, even I, like I was talking about the uh, developing confidence, it's also how you 
redo your exhibition so that there's more space you know? um, and you you know that's a way of developing um, confidence and you can talk about you know historically what were what what was the pandemic like uh, in, in the past no? so there are different ways of doing that but also you you have to make it fun <laughs> Um, this is an example. You know, a lot of young people like to do cosplay, for instance. You can use as a theme some of the, you know, historical collections. Like, for instance, uh, in uh, this example, no, um, where you have uh, the painting, the, uh, the astronomer by uh, Johannes Vermeer in 1668. Um, so. You know, because we like it with because of the smartphones and all the access to um, uh, you know the internet, um, you can post this, and you know you, you know people like uh, seeing something as amusing as this, where there's a contemporary interpretation of uh, of that and how to set that up. No, so Vermeer was about painting uh, light. No, how, how it streams through windows and and all that. So it's it, you know you can you can actually develop something of this sort. So um, uh, my next uh, area is uh, to talk about how communities um, can contribute. No, uh, how we can collaborate with them. So we could focus on our region's cultural and biological diversity because it is really, we're really uh, amazing in that way that we have such rich heritage, such rich um, um, resource. No? Um, and, and rather than look at language diversity in our region as uh, a hindrance sometimes to communication, you know, wh why not use that as an advantage, like um, teach each other uh, certain words that can be useful in uh, also communicating um, in our exhibitions. No? We, we need to really invest in our young people. Um, they are the future of the museums. As I um, tell, tell uh, our, my, my uh, staff in the past that, you know, these young people will grow up to be uh, influencers, um, politicians, um, donors, um, you know, or museum goers. So um, make them like being in the museum. And as, you know, with a quotation from Michelle Obama, you know, let them see themselves in the museum, um, in, in our exhibitions, in our public programs. And then develop possibilities of co-curation, especially with marginalized and vulnerable communities. Um, from my own perspective, I found this a bit of a challenge because of my background. Um, I was taught to kind of feel that I have full control of what I do um, and what, what I, I aim to do. Um, but this is a way of democratizing space, uh, the space uh, in or spaces in museums. And uh, in that sense, it's related to also what I was uh, talking about in terms of museums as public healing spaces. No? It's, it's this participation, being part of, of that. And that's how they can also see themselves in this. No? And then uh, find ways for different types of audiences to find collections that may be relevant to them. Maybe have like an open day, um, bring out some of the collections that are not as sensitive and uh, find a way for them to uh, learn how to interpret them. Because in a way we are all in the museum's storytellers. No? So um, I think in our region, we should have also all these cooperation collaborations such as exchange uh, collections. Uh, if we can have a full 
exhibition, uh, really, really quite important. So um, I want to just talk a little bit about co-curation and um, developing, for instance, community museology or even indigenous museology. So these are a group of um, what we call, it used to be a pejorative term, call, uh, they're called negritos because their skin um, are darker and they have curly hair. Um, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of research uh, that needs to be done and the research should also start with them um, because, you know, it's a, uh, um, important to have that kind of um, story, you know, um, especially the marginalization. You know, the, the sculptures in front of them, uh, we actually didn't want to uh, put that out in the beginning because we find that it's a bit, um, you know, it's a, in a way racist and uh, uh, looks down on, on them, you know, like, like they've not, uh, it, it's also a, a problem in some of the ethnographic museums where if we find that um, all these models, um, even some of the, uh, the fig figures that where we put clothes on they're kind of typecasted you know and um and also uh it's part of this notion of like a functionalist museum where people don't change and that's why the term ethnographic present was uh, uh developed because it actually means that you know that people of authority have decided that these people mustn't change so if they're wearing, for instance, Western clothes, we find that a bit uh, disappointing because they're not as, as uh, exotic as we want to view uh, them. So the Negritos suffered a lot, um, especially during the Spanish colonial period, and hence that pejorative term. And the term now has been kind of used to... to um, used by, by this group of people to uh, express themselves and kind of using that as a term of resistance. No? So th the project um, at the National Museum of Anthropology in the Philippines is um, called, the title is BI or life. And we explore tradition, ecology and knowledge among Philippine Negrito communities, which opened in October 2018, with the members of the Centrong Pagpapalakas ng Negritong Kultura at Kalikasan, um, SPNKK for short. No? And um, it, it was a, a project that's well worth it. It's, um, you know, it's a matter of consulting with them. And, uh, you know, for instance, should we put these uh, sculptures on display? And they said, why not? You know, and so that we can, it becomes a talking point about how they've been marginalized um, through the years no? and been looked down upon. And so it's, it's a good thing. I mean, COVID just stopped us from doing more programs with them. So hopefully the National Museum would take that up because it's really quite a, an important lesson you know, of um, being able to demo democratize spaces. And now after, you know, the museum has opened again, reopened, um, then, you know, there could be a chance for uh, the other groups such as the SPNKK to be part of it again and create the, the, the notion of the public healing spaces. So I, I also want you to, um, to point you to uh, other resources that you can use. Um, the Unite, hashtag Unite for Heritage campaign of UNESCO is so, so uh, wonderful. And I think you should look at it. There's uh, a number of videos on their website. Um, you can continue to, to uh, actually use that um, even though the campaign isn't as as um, 
um, you know, uh, intense as, as they did in the past few years, but still very, very important for you to look at um, how we are in, in the world that we actually have a lot of similarities, a lot of common ground, and, um, you know, how we can also link the past and the past can be, the, be present as well. No? Um, and, and, you know, to, to make younger people appreciate um, certain things about what our ancestors have done and, um, and, and create all these linkages um, um, geographically or, uh, or historically. And there's also the UNESCO recommendation concerning the protection and promotion of museums and collections and their diversity and their role in society that you can use um, because it's really a um, very important tool. And when you are, for instance, campaigning for, for funds um, to sustain your programs and the museums, um, that could give you certain ideas. <clears throat> So um, I'm, I'm on to my last slide. So uh, on May 18, let's unleash the power of museums, um, find ways, and please, um, you know, uh, let the other people know what you're doing so that they can be encouraged. So my last slide is uh, to thank you and also give you another um, image of what we uh, have done in the past about consulting, um, you know, source communities um, so that we can enrich, enliven, create more stories about our collections. So if you want to get in touch with me, my email address is there and you can also look at some of my publications. It's uh, free access so on on my website. Thank you very much. Let me stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, it's uh, well <laughs> for me as a museum person. This is very uh, enjoyable uh, talk and very knowledgeable and uh, interesting information that you share with us, especially the example that uh, the National of Philippine, National Museum of Philippines and you have done on the IND or International Museum Day, uh, especially on the co-curation. Even though we talk about the co-curation uh, many times in many places, but uh, your example suggested uh, clearly of how one museum can do with the resources that uh, we all have. And that, very, that is very inspiring. So uh, before I go on with my own question, there are some questions uh, from our viewers uh, to you. So let me just go through uh, these questions. Uh, the first one is from Septina Wadani. Uh, the question is how to attract, attract millennial visitors to the museum in this digital world? Ah, well, I, I think like if you're going to put Things, for instance, if you have a Facebook page, um, you have to be mindful that the images are actually quite attractive, mm -hmm. and they're not pixelated or <laughs> difficult to to look uh, at, um, and make it interesting. You know, like um, you know, when they say that a picture tells a thousand words, you know, um, it's it's really that it's um, thinking about you know what what you're again that, that notion of who who actually is your audience you know you, you talk about millennials but there are different kinds of millennials um and so you have to make sure that you ad address uh, those you want to target for your museums 
And you also have to talk about uh, content. What what content are you going to to, to place you know, in in your so- social media accounts? Um, is there an event? Um, would you like to to encourage them to visit the museums? Um, on the whole, we you know my experience is that um, you know young people, not just millennials, but even those who are slightly older. They, they really get attracted to sites. And, you know, now it's about Instagram and taking your photos and all that. That, that is the one thing uh, when I went, uh, when I joined the National Museum, I was surprised that um, in 2010, that they were not allowing, or 2011, they were not allowing um, uh, the visitors to take photos. Why? <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy because, they would do it anyway, you know. They would hide, and and and, uh, and, and you know wh- why why uh, stop that? It's it's crazy because the smartphones all have uh, cameras, and uh, people want to register themselves to be part of the world. So, you know, to to make make their presence known. And in fact, after we allow that, and of course, the with the boom of the social media. We didn't really have to pay for marketing um, anymore because they would do that by word of mouth, by posting on uh, their their uh, social media accounts. So it was it's really been uh, lucky to have had that at the time, and so certain artworks or objects became became popular. You know, so you know it's crazy. Sometimes you you get like. Uh, a thousand likes in in just one one go so so it's that i think it's it's a matter of knowing who your millennials are and which millennials are you talking about you know so so there are different creative ways of uh of uh, looking at them i mean it's it's a challenge as i mentioned like with um the digital divide and so i think you should use like local cable television or or the radio you know it's 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 really fantastic i i i am part of that generation that uh, really love the radio and then when i i studied in the uk you know the bbc radio is really amazing um i i learned to write that way you know like um uh without seeing the artwork because it's on radio um the description that the uh, presenter gives um, is enough to kind of make you imagine what the uh, image looks like. And so I said, when I start writing more, I used to write a regular uh, column in a, a popular newspaper in the Philippines. And that's the way I, I kind of uh, decided how I do, uh, for instance, art reviews is to uh, encourage people to go to see the exhibitions because of the way I've described it, and it's it's there's a it's really important to think about content. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's uh, very important. Next question is from uh, Kata Ivankov. Could you please expand on how the Philippine Negritos have been involved in the curation? What kind of participation and consultation was used? Are there any Negritos in the museum staff? Ah, yes. So one, I think um, it, it's our, our, our researchers who actually did that um, more actively. They actually... Uh, went to the different um, Negrito groups. No? Um, one of the things that we encountered actually when we were promoting the exhibition no? was there was a very visceral uh, reaction why we were calling them uh, Negritos. No? Mm-hmm. Um, but we said it was from them. They wanted to use the label as a, an active form of resistance. Um, so, so that's how we actually found out how we should uh, be able to do that, um, to deal with um, 
you know, very, in a way, sensitive uh, topics. It's because they gave us the confidence to be able to um, represent them in that way. But it's also, um, you know, they were involved, like, for instance, even provided, um, like we had one, one uh, case where it's full of um, herbal medicine because they're famous for that. And so they put that together and even the, um, the amulets and all the forms of, you know, the way they would heal, um, um, uh, you know, uh, common and more complicated ailments. Um, and, you know, they, we just wanted to show how in our historical collection, how sophisticated, uh, how scientific they uh, have developed, for instance, bows and arrows, you know, this notion of aerodynamism and how they made uh, spearheads and, and all that. And very, very creative too. So, um, it, you know, with them on board, they helped us also understand um, how these uh, objects were used no? or how are they still being used. Um, no, we, we don't uh, have a Soviet uh, a Negrito in, in the National Museum, a Negrito um, a curator or researcher. But I think moving forward, that will happen um, eventually. We really just need to um, make sure that uh, they get that access to, to education. No? Some of them, because it's a government post, no? Some of them can't even pass the uh, civil service examination. And so even on that score, we need to make sure that we guide. Um, that's why I said work with young people, because they can aspire to work for the museum and say that it's possible for them to be working in the museum. But we need more of that kind of diversity. Um, it's, in, it's in the law. Anyway. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah. Uh, I myself uh, am very interested in uh, this example of the Negrito co-curation as well. Uh, so that's uh, good uh, that you answered those questions. Uh, I think these are from the Facebook. Uh, there's one from Zoom. Uh, from Hidaya from Malaysia. She said, I think it's a she, in the context of community engagement and participation uh, in or with museum, does the museums in the Philippines encourage the public and community to have their voice in museum? Uh, for example, in story and history of their heritage, interpretation or of object that belongs to their heritage and how I think this is similar to the last question but you can elaborate more sure yeah yes I I think um in the sense that um it's go it it's bound to happen more if we find ways of encouraging them um to express their their, their themselves more it's, it's really engaging, uh, trying to engage them in other activities, not the usual, you know, just visiting the museum, but kind of an active uh, way of drawing them in. I think with uh, now that the museums in the Philippines are open, we, you know, that that could happen um, more. Um, I think starting with indigenous groups is really quite important because most of the time their voices are not heard or not heard properly. Um, but there should be a mechanism for doing that. Um, like for instance, acknowledging their uh, intellectual property also. Um, I think sometimes we don't really think of that. Um, I mean, like for instance, in anthropology these days, there's a, a trend to make like what we call our informants, you know, the people who guide us through um, residential field work, for instance, um, to, to call them as co-authors now. 
And that's why we also have to have like, for instance, release forms, you know, if they agree for you to, to um, make use, uh, you know, limited use of uh, what they've told you during interviews and things like that. But there should be much more um, ways or systems to enable that. Um, in, in parts of um, the U.S. where you have strong indigenous communities, there's actually a, a place in, within the museum where they have like, um, um, you know, the, the, the indigenous, uh, the Native uh, Americans no, can come in and look at the objects and uh, maybe sometimes rituals uh, have to be done to be able to do that. Some objects may not be for men. Some objects may not be for women and cannot be put in display at, as such. In in Australia, they've done that. They've sometimes covered um, the cases, um, and then you can just lift it up because some objects can be very powerful. You know things like that. So we've not really had that kind of level of engagement in the Philippines, but I think. Um, in the future that would happen with, um, you know, the stronger assertions of the indigenous peoples themselves, um, because sometimes change does not really come from above, but, but really it's a bottoms up thing. And I think we should, as museum workers, always learn to listen um, to that, you know, listen to them um, and, and be mindful about how important that is for them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, talking <laughs> about inclusivity yeah. and uh, you know, including the all yeah. in our country, in our culture, to be uh, included and supported, uh, even the content in our exhibition. Uh, but there are so many other problems that you mentioned about uh, how to include these indigenous people in the museum work. That's Sometimes right. we have to go back to education if yes. they have uh, access to that enough. And that's uh, when we talk about inclusivity and sustainability that's come to mind also. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and also, I, I think we have to think that communities are not homogeneous. There is some, you know, sometimes there are hierarchies within the communities. There are challenges and uh, conflict also. Mm -hmm. There are claims and counterclaims. So, mm -hmm. but, but I think I, I don't want to see those as problems, but as challenges and opportunities to learn, you know, um, for us, that's why we're lifelong learners. We right. can never really have the, the you know, the um, kind of um, uh, uh, monopoly over over knowledge because there's there are different knowledge systems too. You know, so that's that's really important. All right. Uh, well, there there are lots of questions for you, <laughs> my dear. That's uh, great. <laughs> There's we want one, we want the conversation, <laughs> right? There's one from Wong Siu Fui. Uh, I don't know where she's from, but uh, she said thank you for what a wonderful presentation. Besides study and do the research of the old and historical collection in Museum Philippines, will encourage the steps for the survey and research of the new finding to enlarge the collection, especially in natural history and archaeological? Uh, I don't know the way I read it. Is that a question to you? You got the question. You want me to repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> uh, uh, let me understand myself. Maybe the person who asked the question might want to elaborate on it. Yeah. Uh, besides the study and do the research of the old and historical collection in museum, 
in the Philippines will encourage the staffs for the survey and research of the new finding to enlarge the collection, especially in natural history and archaeological. Yes. Well, there, there are two ways of looking at it. One is, you know, um, you can enlarge the collection through uh, acquiring acquisition um, from field research, you know, from going to the field. Or uh, there's another um, trend that's happening now. It's to look at um, what you have at the moment and, um, and also doing scientific tests on them there has some some i mean i think i read about that about uh, a few months ago that um, they've done a dna on some of the natural history collections and found that um, some have not even been recorded yet in their Mm. collection because it's been there sitting there and then now they have like new they didn't realize that their new species were there all along so so you know things like that Mm -hmm. so that i mean there are different ways of growing or enriching the collection and it doesn't really have sometimes to do with the numbers no Mm -hmm. but it's the um how how those are understood by uh people who are working in the museum so so it's really important that uh while I mean, when you assess collections, you actually have to look at the gaps. And that's kind of sometimes the motivation for you to go out in the field to be able to fill in the gaps. Mm-hmm. But, um, but if you have not done proper documentation of collections, then mm-hmm. it's difficult to see what needs to be done. So it's like um, just doing a random thing Mm -hmm. Um, I mean you've heard of some archaeologists I think even in Thailand where you know they've been in the on the site for more than 50 years or or more you know so so it's it's like that it's because they are looking for certain things and and basically again it's storytelling it's you Mm -hmm. know telling the story for instance of uh, foundation of people who settled on the site or, um, you know, of, of nationhood or, you know, of how we've become you know, and, and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to work in a museum. You'll be busy. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a never ending quest. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that because, uh... <laughs> Uh, it's not just never ending, but the fun is never end, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoy it, right? That's uh, right. Uh, there are more questions from Vietnam, from Lin. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm Lin from Vietnam. I'm wondering if you have examples of the museum ded- dedicated to a speci- specific important natural resources such as Museum of Lake Biwa Biwa in Japan or Museum where is it? or Museum of Mekong Delta in Vietnam. What do you think about such museum and how to promote museum's role in fostering environmental conversa- conservation and harmony between human and nature? Thank you very much. Yes. Well, we have colleagues in the museum world who do not like this notion of the divide between natural and cultural. Um, You know, they encourage this idea of like a holistic view, you know, that that nature and culture will not exist Uh, without the other. It's, It's the reason why, for instance, we we study um, nature is because of our culture. No? Um, so um, I think it's it's quite good to be able to do that. Like for instance, for Mekong Delta, there's so many things around the area. And that's where you, you see that um, sometimes the geopolitical divide does not apply. And mm-hmm. borderlands are so one of the most interesting things for for an anthropologist, you know, it's um, being able to see 
um, all these different, um, you know, uh, areas where things are blended, things are blurred or or gray or you know it's but we, but that's that's really a better representation um, in the sense that um, even even in our our work as an anthropologist it's you know the a lot of the definitions the classifications that we've created sometimes is comes from a tradition um, especially since for instance anthropology was invented to talk about the other you know, because this is the European tradition and this is the other, you know, the, the non-Europeans, you know. And, and so it's, it's those kinds of classifications and even misattributions you know, that happened in, uh, you know, history where we forget that life is not that simple. Life is not classified in that particular way. And so when you study borderlands, such as the Mekong Delta, such as, you know, where you see that culture and nature cannot exist without the other. And that's when, you know, you, you really enrich um, exhibitions. No? Very, very challenging to do. Um, but I think it's, it's really quite uh, nice. I mean, like last time I talked, um, um, about talking about exhibitions, no, it's it's really been worthwhile. For instance, doing um, that exhibition on the Sulu Sea, which is uh, very rich. It's uh, one of our UNESCO World Heritage site. Is there? It's underwater. It's um, and then you have all these, you know, things happening above water uh, where. You know, you have the boat building traditions. Um, um, you know, you have the the mat weaving that um, copies the shimmering waves of the the seas. You no, know, and um, you know, people making a living from from fishing and all that. So, so it's it's that, and how perhaps that can also teach us how to live. You know, we. We have all these issues now about um, our our uh, our challenges. Uh, how do we sustain uh, life here on Earth when you have uh, all this climate crisis and um, you know with all the issues about conflict and migration? You know, when there's conflict, they, there's migration. Like with Ukraine, you have like more than three million now that are refugees. No? Um, how do we address those those problems? So I think it's it's really one of those um, uh, those things, and it's it is worthwhile. It is really worthwhile to to do all these, um, uh, as you suggested, that the the possible um, you know exhibitions or programs that deal with or, or museums that deal with uh, nature and culture. Mm, 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 mm. And I said that that we're so lucky in our region. We just have so much, mm. and again, that makes it fun and also challenging. <laughs> well, uh, I don't want to go to on this too much because I want to talk too much on that. Uh, another <laughs> question is from Lotus KPP. How to make local museum to get attraction to people? <clears throat> yes, oh, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot you can do. Um, I think the main thing um, that I've observed no, um, is that sometimes um, the local museums are happy with, you know, if they have an event, especially if it's, um, you know, a politician who's initiated it, no? but then. After launching it or having an uh, an event, sometimes the maintenance is not uh, really dealt with, and so sometimes the exhibitions become quite stale or old, you know, and things like that. So um, there should be a plan and maybe a, a master plan, um, mm -hmm. and like look at things like how do you imagine your museums five or 10 years from, from now. 
and what direction it should go. Uh, most of the time, the local museums um, challenges are a lot, you know, like especially like uh, are there um, enough staff? Sometimes there are one or two staff members, you know, like the researcher or curator, and then she or he actually does the sweeping and <laughs> the cleaning of the, the museum no? and things like that, because that's usually the staffing is um, not well thought out. Um, so that... And then the, the sustainability of the museum. So to be able to, to grow that, I think um, you should learn how to encourage volunteers. And that's, again, a way of opening up the museum mm -hmm. and managing, learning to manage also the volunteers so that the, they can be part of it. Um, we forget, for instance, I, I've seen, for instance, uh, Singapore museums, uh, they do that a lot. They bring in the retirees and to help out with guiding, to help out with docents, um, um, also as a re in the reception area. You know? it, it's making a making members of our communities feel that they're needed also. And and you know, there's so much. I mean, look at what you have as a as a, a local uh, museum, uh, not just in collections that are tangible, but also the intangible ones. And that's when you can bring in, again, uh, more senior people to tell their stories, you know. Um, but it's, it, you should really have a plan. You should have a program um, and, and think that through what are the aims of the, the local museums and so that you can enliven it and then bring young people. It's a way of, you know, making the uh, more senior and, and younger people uh, come together. Um, it could be like a, a, a space where they can, you know, get to know each other more and learn, learn from that. But intangible heritage is something that's overlooked too. So, it's a way of collecting that, you know, whether it's songs or dances or poetry, literature, you know, and all sorts of um, possible things that that should, you know, you sh you, you, not having enough objects should not really limit you. Mm. Well, and <laughs> another question from Maria Lutz Ingo. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered instances where community interpretation, for instance, that of BA, Luma, mm -hmm. etc., kind of reinforces cultural elements that had been sensationalized or romanticized, exoticized? How have you dealt with those? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, that's why it's important to bring source communities in. Because um, I mean that the you know the, those three figures in front of them, that, that that's a symbol of exotic uh, exoticizing them, you know. And then as I mentioned, this idea of um, uh, what do you call this uh, ethnographic present that they never change. And then you know most of us who just visit the site where they live. We're so disappointed when they're just wearing jeans and t-shirts, you know, because they're not in their exotic clothes. And, um, you know, it's um, the, the museum can play a really important role in that, saying that, you know, that just not just because they're not in costumes in their traditional clothes doesn't mean that they're any less of who they are. Um, and so it's, it's also very important to make their voices heard in that that sense, and not just the curators or the, you know, the official people who tells the story. Um, but but the, it's not really happening yet. I think most of the time, because of years of, you know, the experience of our indigenous groups in the Philippines who are denigrated, who feel that very marginalized, that they have no voice at all, they cannot speak out. And, and again, as I mentioned, we need to have 
mechanisms. We need to have systems to be able to do that. And also, you know, give them the training um, um, because they, you know, there's no, no one system that we can um, find ways to, to, to make sure that that, does, that, that, um, that that's sustainable as well, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think using uh, artificial intelligence mm. with robots will be able to replace or help museum activities in the near future? This is from Nasser Dryreni. Yes. Well, AI is really happening now. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, um, but some countries are more advanced than others. I remember... I remember uh, moderating a, uh, I think the National Museum of Korea or the ICOM Korea's um, project two years ago, where you know like Japan and and other countries have explored AIs. I mean even even in the US and the the UK, um, it could be like for instance creating this immersive tools, not just robots, but the immersive tools. No? But I think um, robots can't really replace uh, people. It's, it's maybe for the novelty of it, you know, like talk, someone moving around and talking. And, uh, but but it's, it's usually like, um, as I say, it's important to see the museum as a uh, public healing space where both visitors and the staff can interact and uh, you know find ways um, I mean like any any tool uh, AI artificial intelligence is you know should be used um, in the sense that it's really helpful um, to the museum um, I mean I've seen I, I in December I was in Berlin and very very impressed with what the Natural History Museum is doing there they've been they've developed a um, system and that's using robots really um, where insects they have i think uh, 50 million insects in their collection that needed to be photographed or re-photographed and so they dealt with um they 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 worked with a photographic uh, supplier from the Netherlands. And so they took pictures of the smallest insects from the top, from the front, and then on the side. And then each label that's, you know, in historical collections, you could see really tiny labels, you know, with the cursive writing. And those were taken photos. No? And uh, so that was shown to us by the the director, uh, the deputy director of the the Natural History Museum in Berlin, it was really quite an impressive thing, no? And so they, I think, they managed to finish like four thousand a day, and they're like in a hurry. And then, so when I asked them, um, "What's it for, really?" You know, because it's an expensive system, and but very, very impressive. And then they said, so we can make that, you know, normally I would expect them to say, oh, it's for our scientists, it's developed for science. No, they, he said, so that it can become publicly accessible. The collection can become publicly accessible. Also, so that people can develop their own science. Mm. So that's what the robotics is all about. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, I was so impressed with that. It's it's so, in a way, it humanizes the 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 artificial intelligence, the the, the robotics. It's really to serve human beings, you know. So imagine to so people can develop their own science. So that means really democratizing the space. <laughs> so I was so impressed. <laughs> Deeply, well, deeply impressed. It's really for education. <laughs> I think uh, that's uh, one of uh, the aim of the theme 
of the International Museum Day this year to the power of innovating on digitalization and accessibilities. It just depends on the, which museum uh, can be innovative on the use of these uh, robot or you know uh, AI and uh, digitalization on what specific uh, uh, intention or objective of that museum and go beyond that. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. Well, this uh, question is already, I think, is already answered by you, but it's from different uh, person. This one is from Raymond Cruz. Uh, but you can elaborate on that a bit, probably. How museums yeah. attract young people were in many hard and fast rule and norms in visiting museums, such no, no touch policy, no picture taking, no talking, and some strict museum tour guide and alike somehow affect the museum goers not to come back and love museums. How can we improve these services? Ah, yes, we have a long, a long way to go in terms of, you know, there should be like um, in, in, in commercial uh, places, you know, they, they have like what is called customer care. And we need to do that in museums. Um, I think the tradition in museums in the past has always been, you know, you protect the objects, but you don't protect the people actually <laughs> so so you know there are objects uh, historical objects like um um some of those that i encountered in in um ethnographic museums where they were sprayed with you know poisonous uh insecticides like ddt and so even handling them is is really quite uh dangerous but going back to the question, I think we need to create that kind of program where, you know, it's not negative all the time. Um, when I first joined the National Museum, I was cringing at the sight of children being told to put their hands behind their backs so Ooh. that they don't touch anything. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, and then, you know, they're like ants just going around. <laughs> and um, and I think uh, before I left the National Museum, I think we've improved upon that in a big way. Um, but there's been like instances where we actually put out an exhibition where they can touch and no one was touching. <laughs> So maybe it's a, a negative, you know, when you say don't, and then they, they do exactly that, they do touch, you know, things like that. So, so it's about, you know, I, I always tell people, no one is born um, a museum goer. And so we start people, uh, you know, young, young children to come into the museum so that it looks less formidable. It looks, you know, kind of accessible. Um, and if it's sometimes, you know, when children go into the museum, it's just this habit of being in the museum. They don't do really so much. You know, you don't have to take them all over the place. It's just a matter of sitting them down, do, a, you know, an activity like color, a, 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 you know, give them a coloring sheet or make them draw, you know, ask questions. What do they think about that picture? Why is that, you know, painting uh, featuring a naked woman or something like that? It, it's just, you know, to pique the curiosity <clears throat> and, and not to just overburden visitors with negatives, you know, not, not to do things. So, but it is a challenge, you know, like... Um, we don't want them to touch the paintings because it will cause issues to the paintings eventually with all the dirt and um, and oils from our hands. No, but uh, but how to make that you know in, in the sense that it 
it becomes uh, real. No? Um, we always say that Filipinos are very tactile. We, we, to make things uh, real for us, we need to touch it, you know, and, you know, kind of <laughs> feel <Yeah>. it. <laughs> so I think, I think it's useful also with the pandemic. So now we don't touch things. <laughs> we might get infected. But, but it's that. It's, it's how to take out the negative. It's, it is a challenge. And, um, and, and maybe develop like exhibitions where people can touch like pottery, you know, that won't be in, affected uh, in a big way. Like, especially if it's high fired with, you know, uh, the glaze uh, intact. So, you know, the, things like that or find rocks and uh, minerals you know, that can be, can be touched. Um, I mean, there, there's some, a lot of issues already. I like I like the science museum in in Thailand so because that that's very very interactive also um, I've been I've been to the one close to the old airport that's really quite nice and they even have a spy museum <laughs> so, mm. yeah, so so that's really quite nice so yeah I mean develop interactive exhibitions so that uh, I mean sometimes maybe you don't need to put out all the real objects when you have, for instance, um, you know, all these interactives there. So yeah. There are many answers. It's <laughs> just that how can we change the word rules and regulation to be away from museum and, and think of uh, another proper uh, term uh, to be used. Yes. One last question, I think. How could museum be of help in our learners' education in these times of pandemic? Yes. Okay. So I think we take advantage of a lot of things that have been produced already um, in terms of um, digital um, media. Like, for instance, there have been like 360-degree uh, views of exhibitions. Um you know, you, you have to just learn, teach them how to use that. But if it's from school, sometimes it's the teachers who are not so confident in using museum materials. And so mm -hmm. I think it's the job of museums to reach out to um, the teachers and make them feel confident about it so that, you know, I mean, it's also our experience before the pandemic when some teachers want us to babysit for them <laughs> um, and because they're a bit um, a bit shy about uh, you know being confronted by with questions from their students if they don't seem to be in authority you know um, then they feel embarrassed you know so it's it's really working with teachers and having special programs for teachers so that they can, use that as an alternative tool or, um, you know, kind of going out of the, the classroom experience. So, so it's that. It's um, really creating also educational kits, you know, where you have like um, questions or worksheets that the students can, can use. Um, it's been done in other countries, but I think we're a bit uh, behind um, in the region and well, we the some some museums have um, been actively engaged in using museums as educational uh, sites or tools. So I think it's a matter of really having also that impetus. I think with more funding, maybe from um, NGOs or you know like uh, private the private sector are very concerned about uh, educational uh, growth. Um, that's, that's, that's really one of those things that can be done, um, you know, with, uh, with more initiatives and, uh, mm -hmm. in, and relating the, the museum exhibitions, for instance, with or collections with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, Museum and teachers, that's another problem 
that can open another discussion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. before I end the questions uh, phase, I like to bring up uh, one comments from our old colleagues, Janet T. Oh, from yeah. Asia. yeah. She yeah. in attending this uh, session, and she said, "Thanks, Anna, for sharing on your work." and research on International Museum Days and Museums. Congratulations. So that's uh, from both of us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I think she will be in the Prague also. So, we'll, hey. yes. so we can have a reunion. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, well, this has been, uh, and uh, how do you say, educative and entertaining. Uh, entertainment uh, to, I think, uh, not just us, uh, museum people, but all of our audiences, considering how many questions that we get so far. I'm just disappointed uh, for those who haven't uh, attending this uh, session on museums, especially uh, many museum professionals in the region, but I hope that they can uh, come back to our YouTube and learn about this because this is very, very uh, knowledgeable and inspiration for all Thank of you. our museum professionals. And I, I, for me, I, uh, I thank you because uh, you have touched upon the, the topic of uh, interconnection between curatorial work and research because sometimes in some museum, I mean, in some country, uh, curator are more, uh, tend to work more on exhibition side, but not with the content. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, they don't do much research. And from what you have mentioned, how can you put up a good exhibition without any story to tell? But how can you get the story to tell? It is from research. And uh, you cannot neglect the part of being a good researcher to be a good curator. So that part, I, I really am happy that you touch on that. And that can be uh, to promote the uh, professional of being a good curator. And also, uh, you have touched upon the, the interconnection again on the, the main subject of the collection and also to be uh, connected to natural history and nat nature and everything. Because uh, sometimes, even though you are on a specific type of museum, but nowadays we talk about inclusivity. So this story is uh, too inclusive uh, among one subject to another. Why? Because of this power of museum, because we are talking about the power of museum, how to achieve sustainability. And this is, uh, I'm glad that you touch upon that. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about volunteer and many other things. I just <laughs> uh, cannot, uh, you know, uh, put this in the, just to one thought of mine at the moment. So I thank you on behalf of our senior Papa very much that you agreed to be uh, on this uh, series of speeches that you will be giving us. So for people who have been showing your enthusiastic uh, questions, you know that this is very uh, valuable talk and she will be coming back uh, on July 25th on another topic on the, uh, on the, what, what is it? <laughs> the <laughs> new, the, uh, the new museum. Yes. <laughs> definition, which she is in the yeah. standing committee uh, yeah. for shaping the new definition of museum. Uh, and you know that the definition of museum cannot stay uh, 
in one definition at all time. We move on uh, to meet the uh, the changing of the society. So uh, come back and attend our spot uh, in that period. So uh, thank you again, Anna, and very always very yeah. uh, nice uh, hearing everything that you uh, sharing with us. Thank you. Thank and you. See you in July. See you. Thank you. And, uh, I give the floor back to you, John. Thank you, Director Sumlak. And thank you, Dr. Anna, for being our speaker today. Um, today's spa sesh, as the director, Director Sumlak mentioned, is the second of a three-part museum series. So be sure to join us for the third and final part with our returning special guest speaker, Dr. Anna, on the 25th of July where she will talk on a new museum definition for 21st century Southeast Asia. And to our viewers, thank you so much for submitting your loads of questions today. And I have the names of our winners based on the questions that you submitted. And from Facebook, the winner is the user called Lotus KPP. Congratulations. And the winner from Zoom is Lin Du from Vietnam. We will be in contact with both of you shortly about mailing your prizes to you. And if you would like to watch this session again, there will be a recording immediately after on Facebook, uh, on our SPAFA Facebook account. And also we will be uploading a recording on our YouTube channel. So please check out SPAFA's YouTube channel. And lastly, uh, we will be posting an evaluation link and we would appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to fill out that evaluation form just so we can improve future SPAFA sessions. So with that, thank you, Dr. Anna. Thank you, Director. And hope to see you in our next session. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay.